very much. First and foremost, let me start by expressing our sincerest gratitude to the Linnaean Society for bestowing these awards upon us. We've all grown up reading and being strongly influenced by the works of the 1908 and 1958 awardees that we saw President Cutler just present. And it is truly, truly humbling to be considered alongside such an illustrious group. I would add personally that I'm humbled to be considered alongside my 2008 awardee colleagues, as well as the many other outstanding researchers, including both you and the Linnaean Society and others in the field at large who've made our research possible. We are very much in your debt and we thank you. So I was asked to comment briefly on the status of the study of evolution today. It's helpful to think about what the world was like and how different it was from today, a mere 50 years ago. So I'll do that. I'll comment on changes that have happened since and finally, <coughs> speculate on where we might go next. 50 years ago, commercial jets had been in existence only 10 years. Computers were the size of whole rooms. They used vacuum tubes, and they were used to monitor the very first artificial satellite, Sputnik. And yet, these computers that I refer to had less memory than my watch. <laughs> Today's everyday words like cell phone and email simply didn't exist. And of course, Barack Obama had not yet been born. <laughs> what about within evolution and related fields? The double helix structure of DNA had only been known for five years. There were ongoing arguments about whether genetic variation was something actively maintained in a population. As today, evolutionary journals were publishing elegant laboratory and field-based research on hybrid zones, mimicry, and responses to natural and artificial selection. However, unlike today, peppered moths in Britain were still black. <laughs> so what has happened since, aside from the decline of the melanic form of peppered moth? Clearly, there have been new understandings of evolutionary pattern and process that came from flashes of insight and synthesizing new data with old. There have been very elegant and, and productive continuations of many of the same types of research that were done up to 1958, including field-based responses of natural populations to, uh, to disturbance, inference of evolutionary processes from biogeographic patterns, laboratory evolutionary genetic investigations, etc. Some traditional model systems have continued to provide us with many insights, not the least of which would be Darwin's finches, studied by my colleagues here, but also various fruit fly and mimetic butterfly species too. Some other species have been more intensively studied than before, such as land snails and monkey flowers, and new molecular genetic models have emerged, such as C. elegans worms and Arabidopsis thaliana weed. However, I would argue that three major innovations, one conceptual and two technical, stand out as having played a major role in driving progress in understanding evolutionary biology these past 50 years. First, we've seen the rise of phylogenetic systematics as a new field. We now know that physical or DNA sequence-based similarity does not necessarily imply or demonstrate close relationship. And we apply quantitative formulae to sort relationships using shared derived characters in particular. This field has also heralded the application of model-based statistical methods for inferring relationships, including both Bayesian and maximum likelihood-based approaches. Overall, phylogenetic systematics is thriving, and it's providing us with an irreplaceable framework that essentially didn't exist for understanding evolutionary processes, particularly how and when they've operated in the past. A second major innovation has been the explosion of computational power and availability. We can now apply approaches that would have been absurdly difficult a mere generation ago. This explosion has allowed for extensive hypothesis testing across all areas of evolutionary biology, and in fact, biology in general, and has generated new predictions to be tested through field-based or laboratory-based investigations. It allowed for the births of the disciplines now called bioinformatics, population genomics, and comparative genomics, which was mentioned a moment ago. Finally, and closely related to this, we've all witnessed the amazing growth of the field of genetics. These past 50 years have seen examinations of protein diversity by electrophoresis, succeeded by protein sequencing, and ultimately DNA sequencing. The invention of PCR revolutionized all areas of biology in the 1980s. And within evolutionary biology, it allowed for detailed molecular evolutionary studies of DNA sequences to be possible by the masses rather than by the few. <clears throat> More recently, we've now acquired access to organismal genotypes at its finest possible degree we have assembled and annotated full genome sequences. This was a field considered impossible just 20 years ago. 
Best of all, this is now possible even for non-model systems and at a price approaching affordability. While we may not yet know the meaning of all the information we can acquire, we can essentially get an organism's complete genotype to study. Obviously, there have been other advances as well, including the porous nature of some species boundaries, the ubiquity with which selection acts within species, and informing new species, and more refined understandings of various patterns and processes ranging from sexual selection to paleontology. All these advances beg the question of what's, to, what's yet to come. Surely, we shall behold new insights and continuations of previous productive lines of research. But what will be different? Well, first, the world is a lot smaller now than it was before. Many of us today have co-authored papers after extended interactions with scientists we've never met in person. Some may feel that never seeing these colleagues can be a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Nonetheless, sharing of data and ideas, both you know, within our discipline and across disciplines, will only become easier and easier, and synergies will grow that would have been impossible in the preceding 50 years. However, I would argue the biggest change in the coming 50 years may be a renewed emphasis on natural history. On the one hand, it's wonderful to have access to complete genotypes, but fully understanding fitness effects requires observing organisms carefully in their natural environments. Much in the spirit of what Darwin and Wallace themselves did, as well as several of their successors and several people here in this room. Natural historians have watched the growth of genetics in awe these past 50 years, but I would, I would argue that geneticists will be the ones watching natural historians in awe in the succeeding 50 years, as these natural historians use classical and novel techniques to interpret the overabundant genetic information. We may find more natural historians very much along uh, Darwin and Wallace's footsteps as future Linnaean Society's Darwin Wallace Medal awardees. This also very much uh, follows in the spirit of your honorable society, which notes in the first charter the purpose of, quote, the cultivation of the science of natural history in all of its branches. I thank you all again for your time and for this wonderful honor and for listening to my talk. <laughs> we're all, and we're very pleased that you'll be honoring more scientists' work in the future by shifting to a yearly award. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Well, I think we should just look at Darwin and Wallace up on the wall there. Wallace is looking benignly. Darwin follows you wherever you move. <laughs> see what they started. See what this next generation is starting. And as Mohammed has said, we recognize that it's rather sad if you wait 50 years before recognizing people in future. And from 2010, we intend to uh, give them an award and medal uh, for each year in succession afterwards in this expanding and most important field. And of course, if you want to be a fellow of the Linnean Society, you just have to have a passion for natural history. I would be very pleased if you would join me upstairs now to celebrate further and for you to have the opportunity to talk to our medalists. Yes, sir. <coughs> Shall we do that in the library with our glass of wine in our hands? Right. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>